1941, Ruth Ellis, or Ruth Hornby as she was known at the time, is 15 years old when she and her family moved from Wales to London. It's the Blitz, and as most people are moving out to find refuge from the bombing, the Hornbys are moving in. Mum Bertha is a Belgian refugee, and Dad Arthur is a musician from Manchester. He changes his surname to Nielsen as they make the move to London. We think for a stage name, but it could be something more sinister. It transpires that Arthur had been sexually molesting Ruth's elder sister Muriel, to the point where Muriel has his child, a boy. He is questioned at the time by police, but released and the boy is brought up as a sibling. Muriel tells her mother about her dad's behaviour, but is not believed. Her father soon turns his attention to Ruth, but Ruth will only say, he would get into bed with me and tightly rub up against my back until he was finished. In 1944, Ruth, now aged 19, falls pregnant to a Canadian soldier, Claire Andrea McCallum, falling madly in love. Though he is posted to France, he promises to come back for her, but never does. Ruth gives birth to a boy, naming him Claire Andre Hornby, lovingly called Andy. McCallum sends money every month for the first year, then abruptly ceases the payments. Ruth's mother finds out by writing to the Canadian Army he's already married with three kids and is back in Canada. Ruth is left to fend for both of them on her own. She walks out of her job at the Oxo factory and starts working in Lyons Cafe. Here she hears about the camera club. Models get paid to do suggestive photos and can then privately go on to do nudes for the photographers. This is when she meets Morris Conley, who offers her a hostess job at his club. Her role is to introduce men to beautiful ladies. Learning the job entails much more than this, she settles in, saying at the time, I'm not harming anyone, we're all adults. I wouldn't do it if I didn't fancy them. An older man named George Ellis becomes besotted with Ruth and offers her marriage and a better life for her and Andy. Being the 50s, it's very different for a woman to be out of wedlock, bringing up a child on her own. George is a respectable dentist. She knows this is a way for her and Andy to be accepted. She says yes, and in 1950, age 24, Ruth Hornby becomes the notorious Ruth Ellis. George is also, however, a violent drunk, beating Ruth regularly. He is hospitalised many times for psychiatric treatment and his drunken rages. Ruth, convinced he's only at the hospital because he is having an affair with one of the nurses, visits George screaming her accusations and having her own psychotic episodes. With this, she herself is prescribed antidepressants, which she will take for the rest of her life. Though the relationship is doomed, they have a daughter together. Georgina. Desperately unhappy to her marriage to George, in 1953 she leaves him and returns to Morris Connolly for work. Over the moon his best hostess is back, he offers her a manager's job in his new establishment, the Little Club, in Knightsbridge, which comes with lodgings above that her, Andy and Georgie can move into. She takes it. One winter night in early 53, while hostessing in the Little Club, 24-year-old ex-public schoolboy David Blakely comes in. He's a racing car enthusiast and pretty wealthy off the back of his parents. Ellis says, David walked in wearing a coat and flannel trousers. I did not like his manner from the start. I thought he was too hoity-toity by far. Within three months, they had started a passionate love affair. 
David starts living in Ruth's flat and living off Ruth's money. They were a very toxic combination and fought as passionately as they loved. He thought her a tart and she thought him a crybaby mummy's boy. It was this passion though that kept them together. She is often beaten by Blakely in public. Once on the 23rd of February 1955, he beat her in the little club and she gets thrown out of the flat above. She moves in with Desmond Cousins, an ex-Royal Air Force pilot who flew with the Lancaster bombers and now an accountant for his family's business. Yet another client absolutely obsessed with Ellis. She has an affair with him while Blakely is away racing in Le Moyne. He sends and pays for Andy to go to boarding school. He is so intoxicated by Ruth, he allows her to still see Blakely under his roof. In March 55, she finds out she's two months pregnant with David's child and was sure this baby would bring her and Blakely closer together. He offers to pay her seven shillings a week. Converted, this is less than 50 pence in today's money. It is, however, equivalent to what less than seven pounds sterling could buy you today. Mm, that's not great for $11 anyway. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just a different trip anyway. No, seriously. It's a cheap to escape. Who wants him anyway? He really is the lowest of the low. He's just a little skunk. Seriously, he's rotten to the core. Blakely finds out that Andy's tuition is being paid for by cousins and goes mad with rage, punching Ruth so hard in the gut, he kills their baby. Ruth will hemorrhage for over a week, getting an infection which makes her seriously ill. Oh, shut up. I have a black eye. They to give me a black eye. Sitting in a car park on New Year's night. Sitting in a car park on New Year's night in Penn Buckinghamshire at the Crown Hotel. Mommy said he left me out in the bleed. I should have known that he knew. On Good Friday, Blakely promises to spend Easter weekend with her but fails to turn up. He shows no remorse for the loss of their baby. He doesn't call or visit. Beside herself with grief and anger, convinced their relationship is over for good, she'll sit drinking perno, festering and being provoked by cousins to take some action. He shows her the pistol he has from his war years and takes her to the beach to show her how to use it. On Easter Saturday, Cousins takes her to Carol and Anthony Find Letters flat on Tanzer Road in Hampstead, racing friends of David and where he goes when they fall out, as they know Blakely is there. The couple don't like Ellis, thinking her lower class and a play toy David will soon get bored of. All three ignore the continuous banging and shouting at the door and Ellis proceeds to smash his car windows. The police are called and Ellis is talked into going home. Having not slept all weekend, still drinking perno and still being goaded by cousins to do something, on the 10th of April, Easter Sunday, he drops her off back at the Tanzer Road flat. Blakely's car isn't there, so she heads to the nearest pub, the Magdala, five minutes walk away. Sure as fate, Blakely's car is outside. She hides in the doorway of the newsagent's next door and waits for Blakely to leave. He comes out with friend Clive Gunnell. Ruth appears from the shadows. He sees her but ignores her and walks round to the driver's side of the car. She fumbles in her handbag and brandishes the gun. Calling David's name, he looks and runs round to the other side of the car. The first bullet misses. Shouting at Clive to move out of the way, she walks towards Blakely and fires a second and third time.
Blakely falls to the floor face down. She walks right up to him, firing again, hitting again. The gun then begins to jam, and when the fifth bullet discharges, it will ricochet off the pavement, hitting a Mrs Gladys Yule's thumb, which she will lose the use of for the rest of her life. Standing over Blakely now, pointing the gun less than an inch from his back, she fires her last bullet, dropping the gun to the ground. Calmly, she tells Clive to call the police. As it happens, there's an off-duty policeman stood in the crowd that is formed outside the Magdala. He takes Ruth into the pub as Blakely bleeds out all over the street. When taken to the station, Ruth is calm and quiet. She admits guilt and recalls she feels a little confused, telling them she was given the gun by a client paying off a debt, never mentioning cousins. She doesn't appear to police to be intoxicated by alcohol or drugs. The next morning, she appears for her court hearing and is put on remand in Holloway Prison awaiting trial. On the 20th of June, Ruth's trial begins. Ellis walks into the courtroom wearing a black skirt and jacket with a white blouse, her hair perfectly dyed peroxide blonde and full makeup. Nothing is mentioned of the miscarriage, the antidepressants she's been on since her marriage to an abusive alcoholic, the chronic PTSD, or indeed a mental breakdown. Psychiatrists at the time spent less than two hours examining Ruth, which we now know is nowhere near enough time to evaluate Ruth's true mental state in a case like this, especially when the death penalty is on the table. Today, leading consultant forensic psychiatrist Dr Gillian Messy says She has the characteristics of someone who is extremely traumatised. You have to take into account the fact she had been abused certainly through her childhood and through to her first marriage, more lastly by Blakely. Like many victims of abuse, this was a woman who did not want to show the world that she was suffering. In the witness box, she is asked by the prosecution, When you fired the revolver at close range into the body of David Blakely, what did you intend to do? Her answer, It was obvious when I shot him. I intended to kill him. And with this, Ruth Ellis's fate was sealed. On the same day, the 20th of June 1955, in less than 30 minutes of deliberation, the jury find Ruth Ellis guilty of premeditated murder and she is sentenced to death by hanging. She is asked if she has anything to say. She barely whispers the words, thank you, and nervously tries to smile at friends and family before being led away back to the cold cells. She spends her last few days writing small notes and letters to all her loved ones including one to David's parents, which simply read, I have always loved your son, and I shall die still loving him. At the time, the public's opinion of the death penalty had changed and most people wanted it abolished. A petition for clemency, with over 50,000 signatures, is handed in to the Home Office, but sadly rejected. On the 12th of July, the day before execution, she asked to see her solicitor, Victor Michon, and his clerk, Leon Simmons, to make her last will and testament. They both urge her to tell her full truth for the sake of her two children. She asks, if she does, that they don't try to stop her imminent death sentence. Michon refuses, but for the sake of her children, she tells them the whole truth. A prison guard is also present. She tells them about Cousin's involvement, including giving her the gun and taking her to the flat in Tanzer Road. Michonne tries so hard to get Cousin's as an accessory to aiding and abetting, which would change Ellis's sentence to manslaughter. It does come to light 
that a secret letter is written by the prison guard present at Ruth's new testimony, but says that she admitted it was her idea to use the gun. The court chose to believe the prison guard over the solicitor. Nonetheless, Cousins is never found. The hangman, the famous Albert Perrypoint, said, She put her glasses on a table, saying, I won't need those anymore. Kisses her cross round her neck and smiled almost welcomingly at Mr Perrypoint before being led to the gallows. On the 13th of July 1955, at just after 9am, Ruth Ellis is hanged. She was laid to rest in an unmarked grave within the prison walls, as was custom at the time. In the late 70s, a number of graves in the prison were exhumed and allowed burial elsewhere. Ruth was placed in St Mary's Church in Amersham, Buckinghamshire, with a stone simply reading, Ruth Hornby, 1926 to 1955. Presiding Judge Cecil Havers sent money for Andy's upkeep until his death. Ruth's grave was desecrated by her son Andy shortly before he took his own life in 1982. Prosecution counsel at Ruth's trial, Mr Christmas Humphreys, paid for Andy's funeral costs. Ruth's daughter, Georgie, died of cancer in 2001, aged 50. Cousins was thought to have absconded to Australia, but never found. In 2003, Ruth Elsie's court case was re-examined at court, in the hope her conviction would be changed to manslaughter under diminished responsibility, but as diminished responsibility was not available as a defence in 1955, Plus, it was judged that the timing from David's provocative acts and the murder were too far apart to be classed as a sudden loss of control. On the 8th of December 2003, the appeal was dismissed without merit. Ruth Ellis, 